The title of the talk today is Cultural Metamorphosis, Recoding Mythology, Transmedia to Transbeing. What I've been working through over the last decade, um, since a first DMT experience, was how to start wrapping my mind around my own consciousness, but also kind of at the cultural level too, of what's happening and how are we understanding ourselves in relation to reality, um, but also altered states of consciousness. Uh, I thought I was on a pretty good track of understanding everything in my life, and all of a sudden DMT put a big stop to that. Um, as Dennis says pretty regularly, and, and rightfully so, we don't know shit. <clears throat> and I was slapped up across the head with that. And as soon as I came back from that experience, I knew that I was going to be making DMT the spirit molecule. And I started to dive into a lot of different areas of research and thought um, as I was doing that. And once we started to do that and started to ask friends and colleagues and people outside the community, uh, family as well, um, kept running into some walls. <laughs> and what I'm going to go through today, several things that I want to look at. <clears throat> Informational materialism. This is the tendency to consider all information as property, though it's not discrete, durable, or consumable. I believe that information is everybody's, um, it, and it should be shared, and it should be out there for people to educate themselves, um, explore, bounce other ideas off of one another, um, and this is something that I think we're starting to see a little bit more of uh, in open source communities, but we still have a ways to go on that. The adaptive mind democracy, <clears throat> activism towards the goal of directing one's thoughts according to future mental liberation. I would guess that probably most of us in the room would want to see a brighter future. And I think we can do that, but it's gonna take some conscious thought on our part to start pushing that forward. Fascination retention, um, generating and sustaining childlike wonderment and resisting culturally imposed obstacles towards intellectual development. I think we can see that there are a lot of things in the world that this, that this happens in where we, we get shut down. We start to do some exploration or we start to get outside the box a bit and things get in the way. But I say that if we can pull back from that a little bit and try to remain fascinated in what's going on around us and, and just being in this physical form, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. So I think we need to kind of open up to that fascination again. Uh, environment reorientation. Let's reconnect to these uh, interactive instincts. We've had them, but I think that we've separated ourselves enough from nature that we don't feel like we have that ability anymore. Um, and I think we need to get back in touch with that environment, understand it a little bit better, and start to understand our relation to it a little bit better. Um, renovation of inquiry. Let's start asking new questions. Let's seek some new answers. The old ones are no longer working. Uh, I think most of these institutions have collapsed already. I don't think they're collapsing. I think they're done. That's why so many people are running around trying to find new answers and what we're, what we're trying to proceed and what we're trying to find out there so many different novel opportunities out there, but it's going to, again, come back on, our, on us to start doing that. Um, and then lastly, pattern alignment focus. Alternatives for societal, societal transformation. Again, many possibilities here, uh, but it's going to fall back on us, and we're going to have to start pushing this thing forward a little bit. So, take a look at this. How many people have run into this before? Once I started to go out and do these explorations and start to ask some of these questions in relationship to putting together DMT, the spirit molecule, I was running into this on a regular basis. Uh, trying to raise money for an independent film is already difficult. They don't give you anything back necessarily. But when it's related to psychedelics or altered states of consciousness, you can see the knee-jerk reaction that people have almost immediately. You mention the word psychedelic, people run out the door. So I found myself running up against this, and I, I just kept pushing along, kept pushing along. And then lo and behold, people started to open up to it a little bit, and we were able to finish the film. But this is still pretty prevalent in our society. Um, and I think it's something that, as we begin to push forward with um, psychedelic research and alternate frames for understanding reality, that we can start to change this just a little bit. So some of the themes, I'm going to run through some of the themes that, and ideas that we explored within the film. And I'll ask, as you're <clears throat> watching these slides go through, try to think about your own consciousness and your relationship to reality, um, and also to some of these concepts. Think about how you're, how you're putting your thoughts together, um, understanding your relationship to yourself, but also to others around you, and to society and culture in large. 
Conscious ecology, the nature and role of an evolutionary significance. Dennis had set up pretty well earlier that there's a constant feedback um, and interaction going on between the conscious, uh, between the environment, ourselves, plants, animals, and I would even take it so far to say uh, inanimate objects from rocks and a variety of other things. And there is a back and forth that's going on there, and a lot of us don't recognize that, but it's something that we're starting to realize that there are other forms of consciousness out there. They may act and move a little differently than ours, uh, but they are there. Spirituality. I've kind of come to, and this, this is always shifting, but to understand spirituality and consciousness for that matter is kind of a break between the, or the, the glue between the uh, physical and also the quantum realm. It's that space right in between where we're kind of going back and forth. Um, and it also seems now that as spirituality is kind of changing and these old structures are collapsing, we're going back to these ancient times to, to pull back some new answers um, and try to, try to retain some of those older things. And that could be the archaic revival, but it could also be more esoteric stuff um, pushing all the way back through a variety of different years. The big thing, especially with DMT um, and ayahuasca for that matter, any psychedelic, but as we're focusing on uh, the spirit molecule, what are these psychedelic effects? Um, is this strictly your brain on drugs? Um, or is there some sort of a lock that's, get, that's being opened um, that allows us to see this larger world around us? Is there an endomatrix that kind of opens up, if you will, that we can start to play with and manipulate and um, form? I think we can. Um, is it real or is it Memorex? Once we started to ask the questions about the effects and what that did to consciousness and how it was changing people, and it can be a variety of different levels, um, what is the research that's starting to come out of that? Dr. Strassman's research was some of the first in over 20 years, and it, it helped open up research quite a bit. Uh, we're seeing multiple studies in the United States, starting to see some push over here in Australia, but also over in Europe and around the world. So <clears throat> there is some new inquiry going on, and it's important that this, this research continues. But how do we start to do that? You know, what, what are the questions that we're asking? Um, how are we setting up this research? And we have to look back to the past. We have to look at some of the mistakes that we made um, and also the relationship to those um, within culture. Um, but also, how are we gonna look at this into the future? I mean, how do we start to tie in the arts? Um, how do we look at the quantum realm into psychedelic research? And there are a lot of different things that we can do and some of these models are starting to be explored, um, but it's gonna take a lot of thought. I think it's gonna take a lot of people from different disciplines to start wrapping models around these things or at least giving us a starting point to, to ask some of these questions in research. The philosophical nature of diving into these realms, um, it opens up a lot of questions. Neurotheology is something that's been popping up quite a bit and how our, our brain, our consciousness in general is representing God, understanding God, feeling God, if you will, or spirit or it, however you want to describe that. Um, what are the science fiction elements to this? I think um, Philip K. Dick, for instance, had a lot of amazing forethought um, that fit into culture. And I think that's something that we could start looking at uh, philosophically through science fiction and how some of these experiences can relate to that. Plant communication, again, Dennis nails this thing. I think that it's, and it doesn't have to necessarily be just through the interaction of, of the chemicals. I think just by walking by a plant um, and pausing for a moment, or watching the way that the leaves are blowing in, in the tree, that's a form of communication. Um, it's, a, it's a way for us to see the actual form or this quantum push um, against the physical reality. And, and I think that is a way to communicate. I think we could see, be able to see this a little bit later as we start working through some of these ideas of communication and language. Um, I mentioned the endomatrix. This is kind of a fun one. I like to think about if you kind of open up and remove all of these different layers or kind of ego, ego setups um, and we get rid of those filters, what happens? Um, are we able to see this kind of larger, more interactive space that, we, um, that we're very much a part of? And I think that as we're starting to realize some of that, but it feels like there is this other dimension there that we can start to manipulate and play with a little bit. And not manipulate in a bad way, manipulate in a way that could benefit society and benefit uh, humanity and the planet as a whole. The cultural aspect gets a little difficult. Um, obviously the war on drugs has done a lot to not only incarcerate a lot of people, shut down consciousness, but also what it's done to our research, um, science getting shut down more or less to, to start studying these substances. 
Um, and again, this archaic revival in the information technology. How is information being shared? And this idea of kind of our global consciousness being represented now on the internet, how are we exchanging that information? Um, and how are we utilizing that tool in a positive way? And uh, not just for silly videos, also that's fun too, but actually using it as a, as a discourse. So I'm gonna propose that there is a kind of metalinguistic evolution that we need to, to take place in our society. I think language is a very powerful tool and it gives us that self-reflection and maybe that's kind of one of the definitions of what consciousness is, is that we have a way to get outside of ourselves or look outside of ourselves, but also look internally. And having, having these things kind of collapse around us, I think shows that the language is no longer uh, relevant for us. And we need to figure out new forms of communication uh, to start to make those changes. So to do this, I just want to run through language a bit, mythology, and then also the human experience. If you can imagine throughout your life, looking back, how, how were things instilled into you? What were your value systems, um, behaviors, and thought processes? One of the things that I've known for myself is um, just through my psychedelic experiences, you're able to, to kind of go back through these reality tunnels and then work your way out. Um, and understand that those behaviors and even thought processes were instilled by certain events, um, certain ways that were communicated, certain things that were communicated to you, whether it be through mythology or religion, um, but also some, they can be traumatic events that can change that. And, and to know that you're not locked into those behavior systems is important, and we can pull out of those and then create brand new ones. So this mythology really has determined a lot of where we are today. Um, and I think we need to start to change that again through the language aspect. But really, what is it? What is language? Simple noises, yes, all the way to complex concepts. Um, it gives us a way to facilitate cooperation and actually have some sort of a model that we can work with to move forward. If a bus is coming, we know we're not gonna step out in front of the bus um, if we understand yellow is yellow. Uh, but it gives us a starting point and a base that we can have an interaction and actually have a place to, to go off and explore other ideas and get back to that metalinguistic evolution. Um, there's a commonality in language as well. Um, Graham mentions and talks about Zipp's Law, which is a proportional relationship that goes within our junk DNA, or excuse me, that, that all human languages have a direct proportional relationship from the most used word to the second most to the third, and they found this recently in our, in our junk DNA. Um, junk DNA is somewhat of a silly term, if you will. It's 97%, but it seems like there's almost a code that's embedded in us that creates our language. And if we all have this as human beings, then it really is an important aspect of how our mind is taking experience in, how we're putting that back out to the world, and then how we're navigating that whole space. And there are a lot of different uh, forms of this, from, from the alphabetic to the pictograph, hieroglyphic, and then also out to the vocal. But I'd like to take it a step further and start to look at language in a little bit broader scale. Conscious and unconscious thought. This goes from inside out and outside in. I think that a lot of times we can have a conscious thought and a conscious way of communication, but we don't really give it time to percolate or to think about exactly what we're saying. Um, it could be a slight word change within a sentence or with, a, with a something that you're trying to communicate to somebody that can make the world a difference of how they're gonna walk away from the experience um, how you're going to walk away from the experience and how that's going to affect people down the road. This thing fractals out. It continues to branch. And from the beginning of the day, if you had a bad experience, then that can filter out to other people. And it's something that we should keep in mind as we have our, our daily practice and move around the world. Body language and dress code. A lot of times, I think our unconscious mind will recognize body language but we don't think about it ourselves a lot of times about how we're actually moving through the world, how we're holding our head up, how we're putting our shoulders down or, or focusing in. <clears throat> and the dress codes are also um, kind of a big part of that. It's an out outward interpretation of what we're feeling inside. Not that there should be a lockdown on any of those, but it's something to think about. You know, how, what are you putting out there just by, your, by the way you're carrying your body and outwardly expressing through, through dress? Sign language and Braille, starting to use our physical sense to, to relay. It doesn't always have to be the vocal. It doesn't always have to be the written word. 
But these are, these are forms of communication that have been developed, but being able to understand that we can use my hands, if you will, <laughs> um, and also just touch to be, able to, to be able to relay ideas and concepts. Periodic table. How are we understanding and labeling, if you will, kind of the micro level of, of the reality that we understand? Uh, we've set up this nice, beautiful map here, and then the interactions and the relationship to all of them. But again, this starts on, the, on a very small level, works its way out as we start to build out compounds and how these things manifest themselves into physical form. Numbers as well, another form of communication, another way to label things, but this has also been an important part of how we're understanding science, how we're understanding an economy, and how we're understanding what we own, if you will. Um, and it's an important thing to, to hopefully put, push forward a little bit. Uh, I think with the, the, all the new science that's coming out, <clears throat> we're utilizing numbers all the time from interactive technologies, um, but all the way through to actually coming up with certain representations and certain formulas to actually understand the world that we're moving around in, trying to kind of map out that endo matrix. One of my favorites, music. Again, just another form of, or way to actually understand uh, vibration and to understand sound wave. We start to build patterns out of these. Um, and it has different uh, ways of communicating ideas. And if you want to just look at the Ikeros that, that uh, shamanic practice has, um, it, it can move and take you to brand new places. Um, sitting in a session, all, the one, all of a sudden you're, you're listening to one thing, shaman switches it up and you're in a brand new space. You're in a brand new reality. You're feeling different emotions. You're seeing different things. There's different colors. Um, there's different beings. So this plays an important role in um, how, we're, how we move through the world. It can make us happy, it can make us sad, um, but it is, it is one that we need to, if you're not a musician, enjoy it nonetheless. Think about it as you're sitting there listening to something. What is it making you feel? Time. This is an interesting one. I mean, when we build monuments like this, and as Graham was mentioning earlier, to actually see these large scale time changes. There is something there that humanity needs to kind of navigate this three dimensional realm in this idea of time. Uh, we, we know that um, psychedelic experience can erase time, can make you feel like it's boundless. Um, but we do live in this physical world and we have to have a sense of moving around at certain times and again, in relation to other people because it, it does make a difference. It's, it's interesting to me how time seems like we're speeding up um, between the technology revolution and we were just firing forward and things are happening so quick. Uh, sometimes it doesn't even seem like we can take a breath to kind of stop and think about what's happened and what's just been developed. But at the same time, I feel like there is a sense of almost slowing down. And I think this kind of gets back to this archaic revival where time is speeding up, but we're slowing down to where when we actually take a pause and, just, and we just are, a lot of beautiful things can happen. Maps and navigation, this is a big part of how we're actually moving through the world. And not just on a, a larger global scale, but even through our cities and our neighborhoods. The way that we're setting up streets, the way we're building grid systems, we're making it more circular. Um, these all have an effect on the psyche. They all have an effect on our consciousness. Whether we realize it or not, from the conscious to the unconscious again, um, these have a huge impact on what we're doing there. Communication over distance. There are many ways that, um, that we can look at this, but I think the more obvious one is the Morse code. And I think even getting into the newer technological revolution in the internet, it's an exchange over distance, cuts down time, but it's just these simple things that we could start to wrap our heads around um, how are we communicating? We don't have to be sitting right in front of somebody to, to have a dialogue. Um, we can do this over great distances. How are we understanding the, uh, the natural world? How are we representing that? Again, very simple. These can just be drawings, but we also are applying terms to them. Um, we're looking at the relationship and that, that it has to, to us individually, but also to the broader culture. And these, these hold true across the board for humans. Um, some of this stuff is old, but we're starting to get into new forms of taxonomy. Um, as Dennis was saying too, there are a variety of different things that are layered within plants. Um, and they directly interact with us. 
there's some beautiful diagrams that I love to just look at because they, they alone almost look like they're a form of communication through just the beautiful leaf structures and the veins that are rolling through there. And these have been actually used for, for forms of communication throughout history. The underground has its own form of communication, from tattoos to graffiti and even hobo communication. Um, you can, you know, within tattoos, I think we can lock a lot of different things from, from gangsters, um, if you want to look at the Kuza, or if you want to just look at punk rock mentality, there are certain ways that tattoos and body modification tell the broader culture, we're not happy with what I'm seeing here. And it is a way um, to rebel, if you will. But it also is a strong form of communication um, to, to go further into graffiti. And then the hope of communication is really interesting to me. And these are only a few examples. Um, but it could be just sticks. You can tell somebody where to get some food, where to get a dry night's sleep. And this, a lot of times we might just look over this, just look at somebody that has a tattoo and you kind of, ah, could be this person, but it, it, covers a, it covers a lot more than that. And this is where it gets really interesting to me. Computer languages, emergent properties of our consciousness seem to be happening as, as an organism gets more and more complicated. There seems to be an emergent of different uh, ways of understanding the world and a different way to interact with them set up the idea of color, set up the idea of form. Um, but when we start taking this into digital communication, I feel like we're almost at a point where our ancestors were when they were able to capture and control fire. Um, we're at the, the point right now that we're starting to see that we're creating brand new realities, creating brand new relationships to our communication uh, to the world at large. And as the world kind of shrinks, as all these cultures are getting mashed together, um, we're starting to create some new worlds and some new models. And I think this is one of the biggest ones right here is um, through computer languages. It sets up all of our interfaces. So looking back at all these different forms of communication, language facilitates an interaction between our minds, experience, and meaning. And it does give us kind of that rudder to be able to play around with, uh, move through different forms, create new ideas, and hopefully expand those ideas into, into, into new meaning or layered meaning and not just one particular meaning. We live in this modern world, um, but also I think that within the psychedelic experience, there are some amazing, amazing things that we can start to explore with current technology, but within psychedelics um, and altered states, of, altered states of consciousness in general that are essentially a fertile breeding ground to start looking for examples of how we can make this metalinguistic uh, transformation and evolution. Some of those I like to look at, and I'll just start at the beginning, and with these major religious structures, I mean, Christian iconography, a lot of people will look at this, and they don't see how psychedelic it is. Even so much down to mushrooms being inside of, of a lot of these drawings and paintings. The architecture of Islam is amazing. That is a completely psychedelic world that's being represented there. And I think there is a relationship between psychedelic experiences, strong psychedelic experiences, and the mystical experience. And I think that's what a lot of these were trying to relate. Uh, Hindi text and all the way to the Kabbalah. Um, and these are just the beginnings of especially these larger structures that relate these. So another example or several examples, and these are just a few, but alchemy, uh, the I Ching, and also the Tarot. A lot of times it just seems that the, the understanding of alchemy is just about changing matter um, or combining things and making gold. It was a much deeper representation than that. Um, there was a whole philosophical system that was built into it. There was a whole spiritual system into that. And there seems to be a little bit of a resurgence of the ideas of alchemy. Um, same thing with the I Ching and, and even the Tarot. So you have all of these different things. We have these institutions that are collapsing. We have all these different forms of communication. And we're looking to kind of make these new blends. Again, the world is shrinking. Um, we can get anywhere in the world within 12 to 24 hours. Um, that's never been possible before. Um, we can exchange ideas and access information that we've never been able to. And we have all of that at the touch of our fingers. 
when you have these syncretic churches that are using ancient technologies and putting them with the kind of traditional beliefs or, or beliefs that have been there for us and have built our reality over the last 2,000 plus years, um, it's interesting to me how these things start to get combined. There's also a visionary art. There's a huge resurgence in this, or a huge push that's going on with visionary art uh, from Pablo Marengo that, uh, that they mentioned earlier, uh, Android Jones, Alex Gray, of course. And these are not just representing psychedelic experiences, but I think representing um, a larger, broader culture that we can start to attach meaning to um, and that we can play with a little bit. So, how do we understand the symbiosis of this quantum, physical, and spiritual realms? Um, transformations between states of matter and energy result in the changes that animate the known universe. When you get a little chill up the back of your neck when something's being said or there's a coincidence, and I even hate the word coincidence at this point, ask yourself what's going on. Look around. Who's there? How are you feeling? What is this little tweak in the, uh, in the strange universe? I think more times than not, um, when something like you know, a synchronistic event does happen, I always try to pause and just think for a minute. You know, what, what is that? Um, why did this happen? Was I supposed to be meeting somebody? Um, was there something that I was supposed to understand in that, in that moment? And I think these things happen more times than not, but I think we, as a culture, we've kind of gotten away from them. And it's time that we kind of get back to that and look at that fascination again. Look at that fas fascination retention and trying to open that up. So I think we can start to see that there is this call it the bioinformation superhighway, but this symbiosis between the quantum, physical, and spiritual realms, these new forms are there for us. And we can start to interact with the world in a much different way. Um, not that we can control it, um, but, but understand its relationship to us and let it inform us. We don't have to be pushing down on it. Let it inform us. We start mapping this form. What, again, are the emotions? What are the, uh, what's the reciprocal reaction? that we're having. This is a good example here of just being able to see form uh, from Da Vinci. But I think that there are many different ways that we can start to do this, especially with a lot of these new technologies that are starting to open you know, our ideas and open our, our minds to new, to new ways of being. And I don't think we have to totally cut it off. The, the remix mythology, this is where art, science, and spirituality merge. How many people are familiar with uh, Hesiod's Theogony? Did it ring a bell with anybody? It didn't for mine either until I started uh, doing some research. But Hesiod was a poet, and prior to, to Greeks, he basically developed the birth of, of all the gods that we know, the Greek gods, and looked at all these different forms of religion or spirituality or ways of looking at the world, pulled them into one, and gave birth to, basically gave us a blueprint for Western culture. And so there are parts in history that we can look back and, and say, you know what, it's really not that hard to believe that we can create brand new ways of being and really brand new structures for spirituality and understanding of mystical experiences. So I'm going to start taking it forward now into this technological aspect and how we can start to use this and understand, um, yes, it's a metaphorical, representation of the, inter or the internet being kind of the global consciousness, but I think it's getting to a point where it's almost literal. We have all of this information spread out, we can access it at any time, um, but what are these models that are starting to get set up for us to understand that? Um, this kind of gets back to that endomatrix. I think it could be this huge encyclopedia that is, I just put three-dimensional here, but I think it goes beyond that. Um, how are we interacting with that, and how are we utilizing these technologies to, to share new information, educate one another, um, and just be with one another in a totally different way? So, starting to look at different forms of design, and how we can use this to have this metalinguistic evolution to, for new representations. Information science is blowing up, and new forms of communication and design are taking place on a regular basis. And that's been pretty dramatic over the last decade, but even over the last 20 years, if you want to pull it back there to, to kind of the, more or less the birth of the internet. Um, and this is kind of where the narrative 
um, becomes influenced in real time. Or could be in real time. We, we might lose that with this next one. Um, Marshall McLuhan, many people know him as the, the medium as a message. One of his later works looked at this idea of the tetrad. And it's asking, what is a medium enhancing? What is it making obsolete? What is it retrieving and what is it reversing? Prior to the internet, he came up with the Global Media Network. And looking at what it enhances, there's an instantaneous, diverse media transmission globally. Simultaneous feed and counter feed. I think I kind of mentioned that a little bit, but start to think about what that is and, and how that expands our consciousness. Um, what it makes obsolete or what it erodes. The human ability to code and decode in real time. It retrieves the Tower of Babel. It's that group voice. Um, it doesn't have to be this hierarchical structure where we're getting everything from the top down. I think there's a bottom-up approach that's going on here, and that's going to really change things as opposed to just having this 1% or however you want to, um, to code that. Um, but it's going to take all of us, um, all disciplines, all walks of life. Each one of us has something important to say and offer to this, to this new mythology. And then what it reverses, um, it's no longer, no longer specialism, um, it's a programmed earth. We're in the process right now of setting up what I'm calling the Mythify Network. This is gonna be a way to look at mind from science, philosophy, religion, or spirituality, um, ecology. You know, how are we growing our food? How are we treating animals? How are we using energy? Um, muse is just representations, um, whether it be dance, whether it be music, writing, art, movies, and then the conduit. This is the interaction space. This is where the forum is. This is not just for a few again. This is going to be for many. And what this entire network does, um, what we, well, what I've done, let me back up a minute, but what I've done with the DMT project and this next kind of form of that is called the DMT Remix Project. We are taking all of our media and everything that we've created from a DMT project and putting it out via Creative Commons. We're encouraging people to use that media to create new movies. Use it in music if you're a musician. Or at least just educate yourself. We used 1% of our interview footage in the film and 23 of the 50 people that we interviewed in the film. So there's a lot of other content, and a lot of other things that I believe will be beneficial. And I don't think I should hold on to that. I feel it'd be a huge disservice if I held on to that and just left it in my, in my safe, so to speak. Um, this is information that has to be out there for people, and it's information that has to trickle through society a little bit. And we're starting to see some of this um, with the DMT stuff, but I'm looking at it in a broader sense now, and every project that I'm shooting and, and participating in, we're going to be putting out all of our content. Um, I'm looking at these as like building blocks or Legos that we can go create new things with. Again, holding back that information seems to just be a disservice. Transmedia to transbeing. Transmedia, these stories now can no longer be told um, through just a book, just a film, just a piece of music. Uh, we have the ability now to share these stories and create new stories or narratives um, on a much broader scale, and they need to be communicated over a lot of different platforms. It's not just one, not just the other, but it's all of them together. And I think this will give us a sense of being able to understand um, our consciousness and reality in general in our relationship to spirituality or, or it, whatever you want to call it, um, to get outside of ourselves even further and be able to look back in, but also look out too. So I say, let's hack consciousness which I think will hack reality. And we all have that ability to do that. And if we start to look back at all these different forms of communication um, or language and mythology, um, we understand our conscious relationship to those, then we can start to tweak them a little bit. We can change them. Um, and we can not just be shut off by them, but we can start to make a difference through this. So finally, I think what all this is coming to is what, what my call to action is for all of us to become spiritual alchemists, to get rid of all the rule systems. It's good to have them, I guess, but we don't want to be locked down to those rule systems. Throw them out. Get out there and start interacting with people, um, sharing ideas. Talking about this stuff, I think, is huge. I think a lot of times, uh, because of the 60s, uh, but now that we're having a little bit of that shakeout kind of removed, we can go back out and have some of these discussions. Um, and I think it's going to be an important part of how we're going to move through the future.